Thank you, Matthew, for your eloquent uh, discourse, and thank you, Dean Rosenberg, and anybody else who's been instrumental in my, uh, my, my visit. It's a great honor to be at BYU, uh, which is, uh, has such a compelling story. It's such a singular institution in American higher education, and yet I think it has uh, many respects in which it could be a model for many other institutions. Uh, <coughs> and thanks also to you for coming and for clustering a little bit to the closer than might have been your initial repulse. I'm at the bitter end of the cold and my voice isn't perhaps as strong as it, as it ought to be. And as we found out in Denver recently, being at altitude can affect your speaking performance. <laughs> My first visit to BYU, I live in Chapel Hill, and I actually have a faculty appointment at the University of North Carolina, but given all the scandals that have been engulfing the football program at UNC recently, I've kind of been in the market for a football team to support, perhaps it can help you out in that respect. Well, during the time I've been, that I've been talking, perhaps you've been reading this uh, citation from Nietzsche. Okay. Uh, in what follows, I'll be speaking like Nietzsche as a scholar to scholar, but uh, I, I really intend this to be an open conversation. So if you're not a scholar, have no aspirations to be a scholar, don't like very many scholars, and still <laughs> feel completely free to participate. So, hypothetically, then, scholar to scholar, what about Nietzsche's question? Is it possible that in our quest for knowledge, that scholars have neglected to know or, or even to try to know themselves? Now, if so, how could we have overlooked, how could we have avoided so fundamental a task? Have we maybe convinced ourselves that it's impossible to know ourselves, or that it's irrelevant that we know ourselves, that it's unnecessary for, to, for us to know ourselves as scholars, no matter how advisable it might be to know ourselves as individuals? And if we've refused to acquire self-knowledge, then are we saying that scholarship is something that you can do without knowing that sh what you're doing, or what you are when you are doing it? These questions are especially pertinent with respect to the field that Nietzsche was talking about, which today would be called the humanities, a set of disciplines whose primary rationale is that they produce human self-understanding. So the question I'm going to be exploring today is, if scholars were to know themselves as scholars, what would they know? Or to put the question in what might be a more answerable form, what are the humanities? What are we doing when we do them? It's remarkable to me how in our time, as in Nietzsche's time, these questions seem to be very fundamental, but they're very rarely asked. There are defenses of the humanities, there are lamentations about the state of the humanities, there are criticisms of the humanities, there are historical accounts about the humanities, but there's very little in the way of a positive account about what it is that a humanistic scholar actually does. There's no department of the humanities in any university uh, in this country that I know of where novices are taught the rules of the game. In fact, since the various humanistic disciplines, literature, philosophy, study of the arts, history, since they all developed independently without referring themselves to the others, it's not at all clear that there are any rules to the game. <coughs> Always in the plural, the humanities appear to be just a collection of scholarly practices that are linked by administrative convenience to form a set that's roughly comparable to the natural sciences and math and the social sciences and everything else, and we'll call that the humanities. One becomes a humanist by default, it seems, in the, in the course of becoming something else. You become a theater historian, or you become a, a student of philosophy or a literary scholar, in, in the same way that you become a human being <coughs> and a mammal at the same time. <laughs> now, maybe mammalian unconscious is good enough for some people, but since the, the desire for knowledge is one of the primary attributes of human species and ought, a fortiori, to be an attribute of humanist scholars, I want in what follows to describe the presumptions and assumptions and methods and goals and effects of humanistic scholarship. And my argument is going to be that the humanities, in their modern form, reflect a definite concept a concept that even most humanists are only vaguely aware of, a disciplinary specificity that encompasses all the humanistic disciplines and separates them from all the non-humanistic disciplines. So that's the argument. But I think the, the context is important as well. At a time when the humanities, along with the tradition of mass liberal education that they anchor, and the public sphere to which they give shape and depth and meaning, are all under attack. And the humanities are sometimes portrayed as if they were a curio, or an irrelevance, or a luxury, 
incompatible with the new realities and therefore dangerous to the state, the economy, and young people in general. At such a time, I think it's important to pause for a moment to undertake a precise description of what it is we are being asked or urged, or if these fail, forced to abandon. Okay, the first thing to say is that the humanities represent a field of knowledge like others. This field begins by establishing a limited set of objects, texts, other man-made artifacts, which it approaches by way of agreed upon definitions and distinctions and theories and other guardrails for understanding. Structured by these constraints, a discourse emerges that enables scholars to identify manageable problems or topics, to test hypotheses against the kind of things that are understood to count as evidence, and by proceeding in this consensual way, scholars demonstrate their own commitment to the practices of their predecessors and peers, make measurable contributions to knowledge. It's collaborative, it's transparent and progressive, and the entire undertaking testifies to a faith that truth can be distinguished from falsehood and from mere opinion. I really hope that those are the five dull sentences you're going to hear from me today. <laughs> but they are very important sentences because these shared commitments are essential for research and they are what make disciplines disciplines. In fact, they are what make them disciplined with a D. And the humanities have an extraordinary research assignment. They have total responsibility for everything that anybody knows about anything beyond what, say, happened to them last night. <laughs> but the humanities follow the conventions of research that I just outlined in a very distinctive and particular way. Maybe the best term to describe this distinctiveness is resistance. The humanities resist, that is, they both adhere to and they deviate from all the basic premises of disciplinarity as such. Now, the first sign of this resistance is negative. It's the inability of humanistic disciplines to draw the kind of firm distinctions that would seem to be a requisite for any kind of disciplinary, disciplinary knowledge at all, beginning with the determination of the object of study. For Angelico's enunciation, for example, seems to belong, well, what discipline would you think that would be in? What discipline owns that image? Art history. Art history, sure, of course. But Fra Angelico himself would not have understood the modern concept of art at all or valued it if he did. <laughs> the painting that we admire might have been described by its creator as an act of worship, a technical accomplishment, or as part of an economic transaction. So which discipline actually owns the Annunciation? Now the same question can be put to any text or artifact, very few of which were produced by people who were concerned to accommodate modern disciplinary definitions, and which, once produced, can float about in the humanistic universe from context to context. So Hitchcock can be used in an argument about the mechanics of Jacques Lacan's arguments. Proust can appear in an argument about the ethics of Jacques Levinas. The history of anti-Semitism is considered pertinent to the music of Wagner, and Sophie's choice can illustrate the workings of distributive justice. Since humanistic understanding is contextual, and there's no end to possible contexts, there's no way to insulate the objects that seem to belong to one field, like this, from the influences of others, or to prevent those objects from migrating from field to field. This, what you might call this openness to extraneousness, also characterizes entire fields in the humanities. Take, for example, my own field, literary study. What's the job? It tries to describe and analyze and categorize and interpret works of literature. Clear enough. But what is literature? Our current definition, in which fictional and imaginative writing alone qualifies, has only been in use since the late 18th century. Both before that time and in recent years, the term designates also any other writings, including philosophy, history, even scientific works addressed to a general audience that are distinguished in form and expression and emotional power. But if that's the criterion, then the origin of species, the genealogy of morals, the prince, the leviathan, the second sex, these are all works of literature. There's also an even more spacious sense of the term that applies to printed matter in general. The chairman of the literature division at a major American university once received an inquiry asking if he could provide all your literature concerning the use of cow manure as a fertilizer. <laughs> if the boundaries of literature can't be clearly demarcated, then the kinds of evidence that can be used in literary scholarship must be limitless. And a Corinna, universally recognized as a magnificent instance of the modern, of the novel form, 
It can be studied in literary terms, as formal or generic terms alone, but nobody would think that a discussion of this great book that focused only on literary devices would constitute an adequate description of the book. Nor can the significance of Anna Karenina be confined to literary study, since the book could be used as evidence in a work of philosophy, history, or religion, as well as in discussions of class relations, horse racing, marriage, suicide, landlordship, seduction, or farming. In fact, that, uh, that uh, Sherman might have sent uh, his curious farmer a copy of Anna Karenina, and sure that he'd never get another letter like that again. <laughs> The other humanistic disciplines are no better able to define themselves or their objects. What counts as the subject matter for philosophy when philosophical analyses have appeared, and here I'm citing the titles of actual books, of Western movies, language, history, the brain, religion, education, the boudoir, money, even manure, or bullshit. I'm citing the, uh, the, the book by Harry Frankfurt called On Bullshit, which appeared about six years ago. It's being marketed again in this season. It's, it's marketed as must-read in this political season. <laughs> <laughs> the field of art history includes in its portfolio many objects that are virtually labeled art, or seem to be labeled art like that, but also, as I just suggested, a great many others created for some other worldly purpose altogether. Warfare, ritual, religious worship, furniture, clothing, or domestic use, but which through the coming of history wound up somehow in a museum to be appreciated as art. Now, as a discipline, art history has been particularly, what I'm saying for the humanities, characteristically enterprising. It's fashioned its methods out of borrowings from philosophy and literary criticism and religion, and more recently, like every other discipline, neuroscience and the evolutionary psychology. History, which has come closer to the quantitative methods of social science than all the other humanistic disciplines, is also the most porous of all disciplines, since everything made by humankind is part of the past. As a well-traveled witticism has it, garbage is garbage, but the history of garbage is scholarship. Specifically, I would say, it is humanistic scholarship. <laughs> the overarching reason for the inability of humanistic disciplines to exclude the extraneous is that they're all aspects of one general inquiry. Behind the plural of the humanities lies the singular of the human. Each humanistic discipline claims sectoral responsibility for explaining a particular human capacity. History, the capacity for meaningful action. Philosophy, the capacity for reflective thought. And a study of the arts, the capacity for creative expression. But ultimately, really, it's all one. The objects that the humanities focus on are interesting to scholars only because they were made by human beings who cannot be segmented to suit the needs of the disciplines. And most scholars, I'm fascinated to see this, intuitively understand that real genius in scholarship consists of transcending the limits of your discipline. They understand that one-dimensional explanations, no matter how compelling, represent a kind of restriction in the deformation of the humanistic project. They reserve their deepest admiration for scholars whose work illuminates the human conditionally, condition generally. It's distinguished not only by such things as learning and acuity, but also by what Daniel Berenboim, a musician, calls a fierce anti-specialization. Berenboim here is describing the work of his friend Edward Said, for whom it came naturally to quote Keats when analyzing the performance of Bach, or to compare the uh, <coughs> excuse me, performance of Wagner in Israel with the reading of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness by a contemporary African. There were, Baron Boyne says, for Edward Said, no two aspects of being human that were not related to one another. Now, one can praise a humanist in these terms because a general non-exclusive relatedness is inherent in the larger project of the humanities, which is the furtherance of human self-understanding in general. So what I'm describing is a pronounced and, I would say, inescapable tendency to amateurism in the humanities. The humanities are a sector of knowledge that are, is founded on a resistance to the very idea of sectors of knowledge. Now, the historical source of this resistance and the, shall I say, the alternative non-professional self-understanding that it suggests, I think, can be located in the development of the American Academy around the middle of the 20th century, where the institutional category of the humanities as a collection of disciplines, including language, literature, philosophy, history, and the arts, was coming into focus. It's shocking 
or it's shocking to many people, how recent the institutional category of the humanities really is. If you went back 60 years ago, you would find many universities that just didn't have this category at all. If you went back 70 years ago, you would find most. If you went back 80 years ago, you would find all that do not have the category of the humanities. The humanities came into focus um, pretty suddenly after the end of World War II. At this time, general education, which is a form of liberal education centered on what was called a core curriculum, was advanced as the model for American mass education at both the secondary and post-secondary levels. Now, the ultimate end of education in the, the, the policy view that crystallized around this time was to open the pores of the imagination in a way that would permit the individual to respond to the unpredictable challenges of life in a productive and creative way. Each of the three branches of knowledge, math, natural sciences and math, social sciences and humanities, served an important purpose, but it was the humanities that were charged with giving people an inspiring sense of the breadth and depth and variety of human accomplishment. In this conception of liberal education, the humanities were the curricular instrument for imparting wisdom. Now, for many years, this understanding of the mission of the humanities was unchallenged, and even today, the National Endowment for the Humanities, which was formed in 1965, describes its mission in these terms. Because democracy demands wisdom, the National Endowment for the Humanities serves and strengthens our republic by promoting excellence in the humanities and conveying the lessons of history to all Americans. Now, to many people today, this sounds politically and academically pretty conservative, and the NEH has on occasion been accused of supporting conservative ends. But this agency of the federal government was born at the same moment as the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Economic Opportunity Act, the Social Security Act, and many other great society programs. The lessons of history are infinite in number and kind, and one could argue, in fact, that the commitment to historical research is inherently progressive that an open or revisable past is a kind of precondition for the liberal values of an open society and an open future. Well, if you consider the past as a set of precepts or examples that are close to further inquiry, this marks a degeneration into reaction or myth or dogma. And indeed, the NEH and the humanities generally have also been accused on other occasions of a liberal bias. But I think the bottom line is that the humanities have no inherent uh, political valence. Whatever the politics of the moment, the conception of the humanities that prevailed throughout much of the 20th century was oriented not towards research and professionalism, but toward the undergraduate classroom, something in which BYU is especially strong, with a vast audience, as this indicates, of all Americans that is envisioned in the distance. Now, let's inquire for a moment into the crucial contribution that it was once thought that the humanities made. It was the basis for the cultural prestige that the humanities once enjoyed. Wisdom. Let's ask ourselves, what is wisdom, after all? Now, in this context, and I might be reading a little too aggressively, but it seems to me that wisdom is supposed to be a quality of mind that, while it's, it's grounded in learning and education, surpasses these in some way. It's not reducible to information, uh, much less reducible to mere intelligence. Wisdom, it seems to me, is intended to be a, a quality of mind that's manifested in a kind of quality of life, a higher competence, a, a way of being in the world that enables its possessor not just to navigate the obstacle course of existence, but to <coughs> bring himself or herself into conformity with the deeper rules and constraints of the human condition, as so that you're able to take advantage of the opportunities that life has to offer. Now, described in this way, you can see that wisdom benefits chiefly the citizens of a mature democracy, where the foundation of governance is self-governance. And so, a state that's concerned to manifest and reinforce the principles of democracy will naturally want to foster an educational system that facilitates the growth of wisdom in all of its citizens by providing stimulation and guidance and a, and a good environment. Hence the concept of mass liberal education overseen by a department of education. Hence governmental support for educational institutions of all kinds. Hence the National Endowment for the Humanities. Now, I know what you're thinking. Not all wise people are highly educated, and not all highly educated people are conspicuously wise. 
But it's still the case that teaching in the humanities aims not just at mere accumulation of knowledge or the development of some skills, but a more general sense of illumination that exceeds the classroom and outlasts the classroom experience. Teachers who are said by students to have changed my life are generally humanities teachers. In fact, to judge from novels, plays, and films about the academy, and they are legion, they seem to be primarily English teachers who fascinate, I think, in part because of the presumption that their academic work places them in intimate contact with the sources of a deeper understanding that might be expected to lead to a, a richer or more enlightened life. Now, I was an English teacher for a lot of years before I realized this. <laughs> but the figure of the professor of literature raises a series of interesting questions. What would a human life that is deeply informed by the best that has been thought and said actually look like? Would it have a greater intensity or richness of feeling and thought than most people could hope to experience? Or would it be kind of dwarfed and defeated by the, the magnitude of its exemplars? What's the actual effect on a human being of standing in the powerful force field of creative or historical achievement? Now, you'll notice that none of these is an academic question. And this fact draws attention to the specific resistance to disciplinarity that pertains to works of art. They were created as expressions of individual experience for the pleasure of others. The works of art are not obvious candidates for research or academic study. The modern research university, in a sense, requires that they be treated as if they were. But the primary fact about works of art, as Robert Pippin has said, is that they invite or invoke, at a kind of first level, an aesthetic experience that is, by its nature, resistant to restatement in more formalized theoretical or generalizing language. The objects express a first-person or subjective view of human concerns that is falsified if wholly trans transposed to a more sideways-on or third-person view. In other words, works of art can be studied in a variety of ways by academic disciplines. But if the first-person dimension is ignored, what it means to me, how it strikes me, if that's ignored, it cannot be said to be understood at all. So the first of the humanities' distinctive disciplinary features is then a radically and fundamentally anti-disciplinary openness to the extraneous. The second that I'm going to be talking about is the extraordinary prominence given to subjective actions, such as the judgments, intentions, and evaluations and interpretations of individuals. In the humanities, but not in other disciplines, mental acts like these are both the object and the end of scholarship. It's really easy to miss this point because humanistic scholarship is devoted to the close examination of objects or texts. For the humanities, the inescapable starting point is the singular object, the product of history. And in fact, in this respect, I would say that the humanities are actually far more empirical than the sciences, which tend to focus on things imperceptible to the senses, including those things detectable only by machines or by mathematical inference. And then to represent these things symbolically through numbers, symbols, graphs, or formulae, and then to formulate these results as elements of a general law or model. I hate to be the bearer of bad tidings, but this is not a very empirical procedure. <laughs> Counterintuitive though it seems, it was the humanities and not the sciences that first introduced in the early 19th century rigorous empirical methods. And it was science that has always advanced by lowering the degree of empiricism in favor of theory. The reason that science does this, according to uh, President Conan, is that empiricism is extremely slow. You know, you're, you're observing, you're classifying, you're measuring, you do this, and it takes up a great deal of time. And all you're doing is waiting for that moment when you can formulate some theoretical principle that enables you to leap forward. And science is always uh, uh, interested in, <coughs> excuse me, in the theoretical leap forward. The humanistic discipline that introduced, in the words of Jim Engel, empiricism was philology, which might be described as a kind of non-humanistic foundation of the humanities. Since the emergence of the modern form of this actually quite ancient practice at the end of the 18th century, some philologists have defined their work in the dullest possible way as a rigorous concentration on strictly linguistic or strictly textual features, the first uses of words, the geographical range of certain forms, spelling variations, anomalous verb forms, case terminations, inflections, 
classifications of languages to the rigorous exclusion of any questions about meaning or value. The modern humanities really resist this kind of empiricism. You could say that they're both empirical and non-empirical, and that while they do focus on the singular object in all of its contingent detail, they treat that object, and this is the important point, they treat that object as the product of human agency, and it's the human agency that is the real object of study. The great French philosopher, oops, well, I meant to do one than the other, but uh, restrain yourself from reading Martha Nussbaum and focus on the uh, <laughs> great French historian, Louis <clears throat> Ten, uh, <coughs> says in the very first page of a book written in 1871, why do you study the shell except to represent to yourself the animal? So you study the document only in order to know the man. The shell and the animal are lifeless wrecks, valuable only as a clue to the entire and living existence. We must reach back to this existence and endeavor to recreate it. Genuine history is brought into existence only when the historian begins to unravel across the lapse of time. The living man, toiling, impassioned, entrenched in his customs, with his voice and features, his gesture and his dress, Distinct as complete and complete as he from whom we have just parted in the street. Now today we have, don't read us about me. Today we have a more sophisticated understanding of the forces that produce the historical object than the one that Ted was working with. We no longer focus our attention only on the sovereign subject, the living man, but we continue to study such objects from a historical perspective as the products of human agency and intentions even if we think that these agency and intentions are collective or unconscious or distorted. From a humanistic perspective, but not from a non-humanistic perspective, subjective states of real individuals are almost literally perceptible in the text or in the object. One would not find in a non-humanistic work of scholarship a passage like the one, and now you can read along with me, <coughs> in Martha Nussbaum's Love Knowledge. I'm interested in striking how little variation there is from, uh, from uh, Ten to Nussbaum. I'm interested then in all and only those thoughts, feelings, wishes, movements, and other processes that are actually there to be seen in the text. Seeing something in a literary text, or for that matter a painting, is unlike seeing shapes in the clouds or in the fire. There the reader is free to see whatever his or her fancy dictates, and there are no limits on what she may see. In the reading of literary texts, there is a standard of correctness set by the author's sense of life as it finds its way into the work. And the text approached as the creation of human intentions is some fraction or element of a real human being. Now, the humanistic scholar doesn't claim to study human beings directly, you'll notice, but only through the medium of the text. The effort of exact perception is placed in the service of a more speculative understanding of something that can never be directly observed, which is the sense of life as experienced by a human being. Now, Martha Nussbaum is not a conventional scholar. She's not an uncontroversial scholar. But this passage, at least, registers a general humanistic premise that the object is to be considered as the material trace left by mental states. Very rarely made explicit. But this premise, I think, informs the tendency of humanists to see reality not as something directly given, but rather as something constructed, invented, fashioned, performed, or imagined. In other words, somebody did this. Now, if there's one commentator has written, Eric Auerbach's masterpiece, Mimesis, the representation of reality in Western literature, made the modern idea of the humanities possible. One reason was that Auerbach was able to focus so compellingly on representations rather than directly on reality. This focus was only possible in the context of another, more spacious phase of the philological project in which the task of exact description and analysis was enfolded within a larger commitment to comprehensive knowledge of literatures, languages, political and intellectual forms, religions, and the, and the interconnected arts. In this phase of the work, the philologist views every document in historical terms as a representation of experience generated by a particular mind at a particular moment, and also what you might think was a representative representation expressing the sensibility of an entire culture. Now, on this premise, 
that texts represent mental states, Auerbach was able to arrive at really sparkling conclusions based on what would seem to be extremely slender evidence. In the first chapter of Mimesis, Odysseus' Scar, Auerbach contrasts the brilliantly foregrounded and uniformly illuminated style of the Homeric epics with the style of the Old Testament, which leaves everything in obscurity, with crucial thoughts and feelings unexpressed, and the entirety fraught with mysterious background, as he puts it. Without ever departing from stylistic analysis, Auerbach infers something really amazing, two utterly different understandings of human character, society, and history, with the Homeric style registering the perspective of a ruling class whose dominance is undisturbed regardless of the turbulence of the wars that it engages in, and the biblical style anticipating the dynamism and instability that has come to characterize the modern West. These are amazing inferences to draw from a close reading of two little passages. But again, the extraordinary illuminates the ordinary. Auerbach made the modern idea of the humanities possible by developing a scholarly method for drawing conclusions about the character of entire cultures from stylistic analysis. Now, very few people have ever attained Auerbach's level of mastery. It's almost superhuman. But all humanists are engaged in the project of trying to recover from a scrupulous examination of an object, the human being or human beings in all their aspects and dimensions that created them. Now, this kind of a project places an extremely heavy stress on the very idea of a fact, that is, it subjects it to stress. As a research activity, humanistic scholarship has to respect the concept of the fact. But humanists have found a way to fold this basic scientific concept into their own conviction that the facts they deal with are thoroughly humanized and, as it were, de-objectified. It's not only high-flying theorists who make these arguments. The impressive but methodologically very conventional historian of art, H.W. Jansen, introduced his 1962 tome, The History of Art, now in its eighth edition as a standard textbook, by saying, there are no plain facts in the history of art, or in the history of anything else, for that matter, only degrees of plausibility. Every statement, no matter how fully documented, is subject to doubt and remains a fact only so long as nobody questions it. Jansen actually compares facts to sleeping dogs, whose dormancy lasts only till some other scholar awakens them. Now, this simile is plausible only in the context of a humanistic assumption about works of art, that a living mind is immured, but somehow recoverable, in that object. The means of recovery will always be speculative and exploratory, no matter how granular, no matter how empirical the analysis itself is, because the real object of inquiry is not an object at all, but a mental state that we cannot, can never know directly. The humanistic approach to the task of understanding is often described in terms that just mystify and frustrate, and sometimes even enrage those of a more scientific or positivistic bent. One is said to open oneself in an act of sympathetic apprehension towards the other. One experiences, experiences a fusion of horizons, a subjective intuition, a feeling of intellectual sympathy. There's a long tradition of hermeneutical reflection dominated by German thinkers from Schleiermacher to Habermas that has theorized the act by which a mind comes to an understanding of another mind through the medium of an object. The German predecessor for the modern humanities, the term is called Geisteswissenschaften, means literally spirit knowledge, or knowledge of things in which the human spirit comes to uh, expression. This actually only makes things, things worse from a rationalist perspective. But this kind of irrationalism is not confined to theorizing Germans. It is broadcast throughout the world of the humanities. The British philosopher and historian, who we might think would be more empirical and hard-headed, R.G. Collingwood described historical inquiry as a reenactment of past thought by the historian. Bertrand Russell, a mathematician, said that in studying a philosopher, the proper attitude is one of hypothetical sympathy. But there was a kind of anti-scientific nadir who was reached by the contemporary literary scholar Stephen Greenblatt, who begins his great book, Shakespearean Negotiations, with the unembarrassed confession, I began with a desire to speak with the dead. No chemist, no sociologist, no economist or engineer would introduce himself to his readers as a person driven by desire, much less by this desire. 
but to a humanist. Greenblatt's statement is surprising only in its bluntness. All of us want to speak with the dead. We all want to engage in that infinitely tantalizing, beguiling, endlessly important, but objectively impossible feat of recovering a mind from an object. The primacy of the subjective applies to every aspect of the humanities, including, most interestingly, the form of scholarly work itself. Humanists don't consider objects or artifacts or events as mind-independent realities reducible to quantitative description. From the humanistic perspective, objects can always be re-described when they're seen from a different point of view, put in a different context, identified as an instance of a different type, analyzed in a new way. All such re-descriptions pick out different qualities, which, unlike quantities, can be disputed. And this is why humanistic thinking takes the distinctive form of argument. Now, as a clarifying instance of the humanistic difference, compare two projects. The first is called Inventing Europe. It's a massive collective research project underwritten by the European Science Foundation. It involves hundreds of scholars who will be unfolding their conclusions over six volumes. It describes itself in the following way. The Eurocorp program Inventing Europe creates a platform for transnational research and the long-term process of European integration. It uses the lens of history of technology to arrive at a cultural history of innovation processes. By looking at transnationally developed and used technologies as cultural products, this research program aims at understanding the varied ways in which people have built, explored, and also opposed the concept and practice of Europe over the past 150 years. Okay. The second is called Inventing Europe. It's a 1995 book by a historian named Gerard Delante who describes his book in this way. This book is about how every age invented the idea of Europe in the mirror of its own identity. Europe is as much an idea as it is a reality, note the emphasis on the subjective. But it's also a contested idea, and it was in adversity that European identity was constructed as a dichotomy of self and other. The book analyzes the origins and developments of the idea of Europe as a social construction from the earliest times to the present. Its challenging thesis is that the European idea has lent itself to a politics of division and exclusion, which has been disguised by superficial notions of unity. Now, note that the vastly collaborative scientific project does not represent itself as the product of interpretation. It does not seem to involve any contested or even contestable claims. It sees itself as an accumulation of more knowledge to what is already known. It understands itself to be making a wholly positive a non-controversial addition to a mass of established facts. By contrast, the single author humanistic project at the right <coughs> takes the form, as I said, of an argument that seeks to challenge received wisdom or conventional thinking. Its goal is not to add to our mass of factual knowledge, but to persuade the reader to accept a different understanding than the one that he or she already had. This emphasis on the subjective applies not only to the aims and methods of scholarship, but even to the scholar, him or herself. Near the end of Mimesis, Auerbach, whose subject, incidentally, was also the invention of Europe, explains that as a wartime exile in Istanbul during the Second World War, he had to work without the materials that would have been available to him at the German research library. And he said that this restriction threw me on my own resources, my learning, my experience, my sense of life. In the end, he said, he came to embrace these limitations because they actually clarified the essential condition of the scholar, alone with the mystery of the primary text. As he put it, there is always going on within us a process of formulation and interpretation whose subject matter is our own self. Once again, Auerbach represents an exceptionally distinguished instance of a general circumstance. We are always, we could say, in exile from the past. The evidence is always insufficient for us to claim a full or final understanding. And so we have to turn inward if we want to be able to write what Auerbach called the inner history of mankind. That is the goal of true philology. Now, this concentration on subjectivity has, I think, a deeper point. The humanities can't produce the kind of knowledge that the sciences can. They don't aspire to the kind of predictive power that the social sciences claim. But they do serve another function that is fully as valuable as these. They liberate the mind from its subservience 
to fact. The humanistic study of documents and artifacts is undertaken in the service of a larger project of withdrawing the sort of thought from the stone of necessity. The humanities, you could say, are where the ineluctability of the world is both recognized and suspended, where the mind is disciplined to the task of precise observation and also invited to luxuriate in possibility, where things fertilized by thought stir into unexpected life, where we're invited to think differently, where knowledge strains for something beyond knowledge. In other words, the humanities answer to a hunger for meaning in excess of what is given, customary, self-evident, directly deducible from fact or legitimated by authority. They correspond to what Hannah Arendt called comprehension, which in her formulation means the unpremeditated, attentive facing up to and resisting of reality. From a humanistic perspective, the object never provides the evidence required for its own understanding. As a consequence, observation itself must at some point give way to a speculative leap into the domain of the possible. In a very deservedly famous passage from an essay on man, Ernst Kassir, who along with Auerbach and Arendt was among the formidable group of emigre scholars who established many of the foundational principles of the humanities, describes the power and value of symbolic thought in just these terms. The great mission is to make room for the possible as opposed to a passive acquiescence in the present actual state of affairs. It's symbolic thought which overcomes the natural inertia of man and endows him with a new ability, the ability constantly to reshape this human universe. Now there's one final feature of the humanities that deserves separate consideration, and I'm talking here about the extraordinarily close relationship between the scholar and scholarship. The intimate, even loving character of this relationship becomes evident whenever one compares presentations by scientists who almost never have a text in front of them when they're talking, and humanists who almost never lack one. The reason is not that scientists are more articulate than humanists, although they are disturbingly fluid sometimes. <laughs> But the reason is that in science, the focus is on the information. They can speak extemporaneously about their slides because the precise phrasing of each sentence is not important to them. To a scientist, the act of writing it up is the final, perhaps perfunctory, unproblematic uh, stage in the preparation of a publication. While to a humanist, the act of composition involves extraordinary expenditures of time and care. Indeed, much of the most valuable thinking that a humanist does uh, occurs under the pressure of discovering the right word, the right balance of elements, the right connecting links, these little technical things. Co-authorship, the norm in scientific and social scientific publications, is rare in the humanities because each scholar regards his words not just as exceptionally felicitous, which of course they are, but as precious in some deeper sense because they are connected to identity. This connection often begins with a choice of subjects, a choice for which the humanist is in obscure ways responsible. The range of the humanities is vast. You can choose to work on subjects that speak perhaps directly or indirectly, analogically, or at a deeper level to your own interests or experience or self-understanding. I remember I read a, an article one time uh, that uh, described uh, 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 the 19th century novel and said that the, 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 the central 19th century novel the one that illuminated the whole field most efficiently was Frankenstein. And I was at a conference uh, shortly after reading this article, and I saw this guy's name on the program, so I went up and introduced myself. And I saw he's about six foot four and a big neck. And <laughs> <laughs> what? No point that I could tell. But, <laughs> but the point is that scholars choose subjects that they care about as products of human agency in the first instance. The subjects of humanistic scholarship can elicit or repel your sympathies, and these perhaps unconscious responses provide the scholar with a perspective, an angle of approach, a set of unspoken premises that guide the work and provide what Auerbach called an Ansatzpunkt, or an intuitively determined point of departure. In this sense, humanistic scholarship can be considered an expressive discourse in a way that social scientific and scientific discourse simply cannot. The necessity of individual investment carries considerable risks. Samuel Schoenbaum began his Shakespeare's Lives 
by recalling a moment when he was peering at this well-known portrait of Shakespeare on the right there. It, he, he was just looking at the portrait, getting as close as he possibly could. He drew ever closer in a strained attempt to penetrate the astonishingly powerful and various mind behind this familiar image until he realized that what he was actually seeing in the lacquered surface, a ghostly image, it was his own reflection. <laughs> I think this is actually quite suggestive. At the deepest level of penetration, the humanist scholar encounters himself again, coming face to face with the realization that his scholarly desire to speak with the dead can become entangled with an unacknowledged desire for narcissistic self-confirmation or defeated by narcissistic self-enclosure. <laughs> now, a scientist might say that the presence of desire, any desire, but especially this desire, contaminates the entire undertaking. But a humanist recognizes this as the condition of knowledge, the tragic comic condition of knowledge. The subject matter, as Auerbach says, is oneself. This personal investment in the object of inquiry helps explain one of the most disciplined resistant features of humanistic scholarship, this tolerance for and even, idiosync uh, even encouragement of stylistic idiosyncrasy. Idiosyncrasy is the mark of subjective freedom. And the humanities, as I was trying to indicate earlier, are a discourse of freedom, beginning with the freedom to pick your subject, ending with the freedom to make arguments that are supported by the facts but not compelled by the facts. Academic freedom, and in fact, I think freedom in general, are exemplified by humanistic scholarship, the most distinguished examples of which record an encounter between a complex and difficult subject and an informed and engaged mind. At a memorial service in 2003 for his friend and mentor, the Renaissance scholar Thomas Green, the Princeton scholar Leonard Barkin said, it's the mark of great scholars that their work demonstrates a personal signature, the griff that weaves its way through a great diversity of, su of subjects and concerns. In the work of the greatest of the great scholars, Barkin continued, this set of ongoing individual markers is also the bearer of moral, ethical, spiritual conviction, quite apart from, but woven together with, matters of learning, of history, of critique, of interpretation. Individualized patterns of responsiveness, evaluation, and expression are not just the mark of the individual, the kind of manufacturer's mark, which is what a griff is, but the sign of a scholar's worldly and personal engagement with the material and the task of scholarship. A very great scholar himself, Kassir, insisted that the scholar's quest was actually for a personal truth. If the historian succeeded in effacing his personal life, Kassir wrote, he would not thereby achieve a higher objectivity. He would, on the contrary, deprive himself of the very instrument of all historical thought. Now, of course, Kassir is speaking here of a tiny group of highly trained scholars. In the post-war American setting, this insistence on the value of a personal truth was democratized and extended in principle to everyone through the concept of mass liberal education that I mentioned earlier. This extension represents the most radical and brilliant aspect of the American system of education. Now, as Barkan suggests, not all griffs can bear the burden of meaning. Some, such as the use of the personal pronoun, are merely humanizing or pseudo-humanizing gestures that create a, a kind of faux personal relationship with the reader. Others represent mere stylistic or cognitive tics, things you can't help doing. And some of those intended to be meaningful can fail in their purpose. When a, when a scholar intending to manifest a, an admirable moral uh, intensity departs from the task at hand to register an opinion, the result might be a breach of the very fragile compact that binds writer to reader. But this compact is always at risk in a discourse that is understood to be so mind dependent and individualized that even impersonality can be seen as a uh, form of expression. The philosopher Slavoj Žižek argues that his radical difference, as he sees it, from mainstream humanistic scholarship is marked by his refusal of any taint of individual personhood. He says, where most academic writers give a little glimpse beneath an impassive professional style of a so-called lively personality, he prides himself on being the author of books whose excessively and compulsively witty texture <laughs> serves as the envelope of a fundamental coldness. <laughs> now, Zizek might aspire to impersonality, but his work is cherished by many people and absolutely denounced by many others. 
precisely because of the highly marked and almost painfully exposed individuality of his style. Enter. Ah, great. Now, it seems that Nietzsche's suggestive assessment of the state of scholarly self-knowledge requires a little bit of adjustment. It's not true that scholars neither know themselves nor seek themselves. They encounter themselves continually in every scholarly act, but only indirectly in the course of mixing their cognitive labor with their objects. On the other hand, Auerbach's assertion that the subject matter is our own self also has to be modified for the same reason. The self is ubiquitous, but it's never grasped except in the form of a ghostly image in the glaze, as it were, of the text. It's the confusion of observation and introspection, cold analysis and self-expression, that defines the discipline resisting discipline of the humanities. Now, at the beginning, I mentioned the context for arguments about the humanities. I want now to return to that context with a couple of words, uh, beginning with the suggestion that the stakes for the humanities have never been merely academic. As early as 1952, Auerbach said, human life is becoming standardized, and that a process of concentration and imposed uniformity was threatening all individual traditions, all individual identities. This is remarkably appreciated from 1952, because today that process has advanced well beyond the point that Auerbach, writing during the Cold War, would have been able to imagine. The manifold processes known collectively as globalization represent one set of threats to individual traditions, but just within the United States, a marked increase in economic and ideological rigidity has been accompanied by a pronounced conformity within polarized groups <clears throat> with widely acknowledged destructive effects on the public sphere. Indeed, what passes for the public sphere today, I think, is a kind of zombie imposter, an increasingly privatized public space in which interests formerly considered public struggle to be heard. In the current social and political dispensation, when the foundational concepts associated with the humanities, openness, the primacy of the subjective, and ownership of and responsibility for one's own discourse, when these are being hollowed out, an affirmation of the humanities, and specifically of the humanistic resistance to concentration and uniformity and discipline, undertaken as part of a defense of a genuinely public realm open to genuinely private individuals. I think this has implications and perhaps consequences beyond itself. The perpetual crisis that accompanies, disturbs, and defines the humanities is actually a nested series of crises. The humanities themselves constitute an ongoing crisis in institutions that are founded on the belief that an education should consist just of the transmission of information or the acquisition of skills. When a democratic society loses faith in the kind of freedom and responsibility exemplified by the humanities, I would say that that society is in crisis. And when humanistic scholars lose faith in their own discipline, try to conform their practice to other disciplines or professions, they themselves fall into crisis. The crisis of the humanities is severe, multidimensional, it is amazingly resilient. But perhaps not all is lost. People in crisis need wisdom, and if humanists can understand their work as a response to this need, a way of thinking of and in crisis, they should be able to find an honorable and perhaps even an honored place in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very rich talk. Uh, we have uh, a reception in a bit, but we have some time uh, up to 20 minutes if you like for questions. So please, any questions for our speaker? Challenges? <laughs>
it's considered the founding sort of um, text for anthropology and sociology. Right. The so, social sciences are actually an equivocal mode uh, because, as the term suggests, the, the scientific aspiration is quite real to many people. And many social scientists do largely quantitative work. Then there's the interpretive social sciences, which is an ambiguously defined, but to my way of thinking, very, very powerful segment of, uh, of, of, of social science in which interpretation is, is, is welcomed. And when combined with a rigorous understanding of empirical fact, it produce very powerful results. My own son is uh, uh, earnestly uh, trying, he's a graduate school, earnestly trying to become an interpretive social scientist. So I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't denigrate that for anything. But you're exactly right. Yes? Um, anthropologist Clifford Gerritz yes. um, cited Alton Becker, an anthropological linguist, um, calling for a new philology. Yes. Sort of a reconciliation between the divorce parties of literature and language. Yes. And I want to know if your presence here and your presentation are signs that there is a new philology and that a new philology that combines language studies and literary studies, or at least recombines them, um, might be a way to um, resolve the crisis. You know, you've, you've, uh, you've done a very dangerous thing, because uh, I could easily talk for much longer than we have even to have the reception that <coughs> about this subject. The subject of philology, as I indicated in a kind of uh, uh, casual remark, can be extraordinarily dull. You know, first usages of terms, case terminations, etc., just marking these things. But really, there is, to my way of thinking, no more dramatic, exciting, or unexpected subject in all of intellectual history than the subject of philology. It's just the greatest thing in the world. Not the philology itself, but the history of the concept of philology. Uh, that history, for my purposes, begins in 1795 with Vols' uh, prologamenum to, uh, prologamen, to, to Homer, and goes from there. But it, uh, uh, it, it quickly becomes a search for not just the, uh, the, the Homeric language or the authentic voice of Homer behind these myriad Homer, Homeric texts, but then for a kind of classification of languages and for the Ur languages that underlie languages for Indo-European, which very rapidly uh, at the beginning of the 19th century became a, a search for the Aryan language. And at that it was an extraordinarily fateful moment when the philological quest, which was very rigorous, very scholarly, and immensely impressive, became sidetracked into a search for the origins of the Aryan people. Uh, with all the deformations that you can imagine. Philology in the middle of the 19th century was the home for learned anti-Semitism. Now there were some philologists who were doing you know, what, what would be honorable, in fact astonishingly admirable work, but uh, there were others, including uh, uh, Max Mueller and Ernst Renan, two of the most uh, enlightened people and, and learned people in all of Europe and in the entire world really, in the middle of the 19th century who were convinced that the Aryan language uh, uh, was deeply superior to the Semitic languages. And the way they described the differences between the Aryan languages and the Semitic languages exactly mapped on to the conventional stock image of the Jews as kind of hard-hearted, inflexible, ungenerous, slightly primitive, monomaniacal, and then the, the, uh, uh, the Indo-Europeans on the other as kind of generous, various, open, <coughs> flexible, in, in a word, modern. Uh, uh, this is, in, in many respects, a, a, a tragic story. But the idea that we can regenerate scholarly practice by returning to pure or authentic philology is amazingly persistent. Edward Said, whom I cited, wrote an article at the end of his life called The Return to Philology. Paul Devon, uh, the uh, perhaps tainted but still deeply impressive uh, uh, literary theorist, wrote an article toward the end of his life called The Return to Philology. Medievalists have written uh, with passion and in, 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 in force for a return to philology. It always seems to everybody a good idea to return to philology. Uh, this despite the lurid history of philology as a discipline, something that is capable of being kind of shunted off into the, the, the darkest and most sinister currents of, of, of thought and more than thought. So um, while I would be very cautious 
about a kind of uncritical return to philology, I couldn't agree with you more that we could learn a very great deal from returning to philology in all of its complexity in a historical sense. And an attention to the text, it's always a good idea. <laughs> always a good idea. Learn an attention to the text. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your, for your talk, first of all. Um, and this is not a challenge, I'm, I, but I'm asking, I guess, to think maybe beyond the talk a little bit. Um, it seems to me that one of the, the focuses here is finding that, what you've called other, in other places, the human voice, to that close, careful, attentive reading, um, and the wonderful examples you've given. But I'm wondering if, in a contemporary moment, where things seem to be shifting, um, the way somebody like Kate Hales would say, where our actual thinking processes are changing, or that close, attentive reading to content need to be preserved in a certain way, but also integrated with a, another model of reading that stays at the surface. Not necessarily distance reading, or of course the determined readings or something like that, but actual surface readings of large data sets, pattern recognition, the kinds of methodologies that seem to be marking this emergent digital humanities. And I'm wondering how you'll bring together this model that you've talked about and presented here so, so well with this competing model of the humanities, which seems to be predicated on a different sense of what it means to be a human, what a different sense of what it means to be human thinking, uh, along those lines. Right, uh, I know Kate quite well, and I've known her for many years. Uh, she is truly out there. <laughs> um, uh, one, of the most, one of the most adventuresome thinkers yeah. that, that, that I know. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And the, the, She's been extraordinarily responsive to the changes in cognition that are wrought by digital technology. She's been, for example, keenly attentive to the, the way that people have figured out people read web pages. It's in the shape of an F. That is, you go across the top line, maybe the second line, not quite so far, and then you go down the left-hand side. That's the, that's the way, way you read a page <laughs> on a display. It's not the way you read a page, but it's the way you right. and. <coughs> She thinks that uh, this, what might seem to be superficial difference, or rather a difference of superficiality as opposed to depth, is actually one part of a much larger and more multifaceted and ambiguous shift that she's trying to track in her work that will ultimately produce different kinds of cognition and a new norm for cognition. You note at the beginning of my text I said I, I, I'd like to take this moment, you know, when we're being urged from all sides uh, to, uh, you know, think critically about the humanities. Take this moment to undertake a precise description of what the humanistic perspective actually is. Now, Kate is actually, for a digital humanist, she is very humanistic. She continues to be interested in literature, although it's literature increasingly of a certain kind. Uh, others are less interested in literature. If they are trained in the digital humanities, they have often a kind of glancing relationship to literature, but they are technically wizards. Uh, and she thinks that ultimately this is going to produce, when sown throughout the populace, uh, different kinds of cognition and a different understanding of the human. Uh, she sees us surrounded by all of our machines, and she sees these machines as kind of mental prostheses. She sees that our cognition, through our phones, our iPhones, our, our, our iPads, our computers, is networked. So it's no longer just in, in the mind. We are networked intelligences, so that uh, our particular brain is just a node in the network, and not necessarily the central node in the network. That's a really a disturbing thought uh, to many people. She sees this as uh, uh, a, uh, a, a phase of evolution, a Darwinian evolution. She sees us becoming different. And uh, uh, however you feel about this, I guess history will tell. But as we are becoming different, and I'm not confident I can say which way we are becoming different, but as we are becoming different, I wanted to take this moment to pause and say what it is the human and the, and the humanities and humanism represent right now. So I wouldn't want to put my finger in the dike or stand against, uh, stand against the tanks. I couldn't even if I, even if I wished to. But I think it's important to note what the humanities are so that you can at least get some sense of the stakes involved in either clinging to them, embracing them, nurturing them, or just letting them quietly go.
Or as in her, her recent book, she's bringing them together in how we... Well, she says she's bringing them together. She has a clear sense of progress. Yeah. Uh, uh, she thinks that the, that the human, as a species, mm -hmm. is evolving in the way that I just outlined. Can I just ask one question kind of as an elaboration on the question uh, that Billy asked? And it's on the point you're making, I think it's a good point, which is that the humanities, you look at the history of the humanities, they themselves have not always meant the same thing, and I thought understood themselves the very same way. I'm thinking about, you said about context, right. contexts are endless. That's right. I mean, yet the practices of how we understand context can limit our engagement of context. Think about new criticism, for example, right? What we study is the thing itself, the poem itself, and not anything around it, uh, any context around it, or in deconstruction. So that there's a kind of a ritualistic relation at two contexts that can limit or expand how we understand what the humanities do vis-a-vis -vis our own selves, our history, our right. context, our expressions. So in other words, this moment, uh, though very new in some respects, Ken Hales would say, in other ways, is another moment in a history where the humanities go back and ask themselves whether or not they have the right as agents to engage contexts, uh, what those contexts mean, what it means for knowledge. Well, as Kate herself would say, uh, the humanities have always been where the question of the human has been worked out where it's been explored, where it's been negotiated, where it's been defined. And uh, I think that's actually a very noble task. It's not the same task from generation to generation. It's a slightly different task with different answers. But the humanities are where the question of the human is worked up. Shall we proceed to the reception? I want to ask, the, what, Cynthia, yeah, please. I just wanted to do a follow-up on your follow-up. That's what Be Becker said about the new philology is that it is a philology of contextual relations. It's not a context-free linguistics like theoretical linguistics. It's a context-based rhetoric. Yes. That was the definition of philology, is a contextually-based linguistics. So then, one of the six areas that he outlines are media contexts. Um, so it has, I do think it has power to answer some of these questions. Perhaps you'll be one to advance that, uh, that inquiry then. Very good. I look forward to it. Thanks so much.